sounds intense, doesn't it? <laughs> you guys give our worship team a just a praise and give the Lord some praise. Literally, what they just sang about is what we are here for. It's what I'm here for. Join me in prayer and let's just, just ask God. Father, we are here for you. Uh, we ask for your presence. We thank you that your Holy Spirit is here with us where two or more are gathered in your name. We are gathered in your name and we thank you that you're here. But I just ask that you somehow supernaturally let us empty ourselves out this morning of anything that we brought in here that is not of you. Allow us to forgive, allow us to set aside, allow us to cast everything to you that may be a distraction in Jesus' name. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So glad you're here. I'm so glad the series didn't scare you away already called Yellowstone. Like, like we've had more conversations about this series title, I think, in, in the last two weeks. And here's the deal. What the, what the enemy meant for evil and to divide, God will use for his good. Amen. God will use for his good and the good of those that love him. Praise God. Praise God we have his word. We know his promises. Like, let's not let the enemy claim things in this world that are actually God's to begin with. Amen? We're in week two. Week one was last week. If you missed it, please go online. You'll get to check out the why we're in this. And we talked about two kingdoms. Week two, we're talking about this is his kingdom. And what we just sang about his presence that's why we're here his kingdom his presence it's not even about you or me right it's about him it's about him this whole series is is trying to help us with this progressive life this world is selling is empty it's it's in a time where we are bombarded with distraction and pseudo happiness that promises to fill our soul but it doesn't, it doesn't last, does it? Like we've tried it. Like we've tried it. We've tried doing it our own way. We've tried taking things in our own hands, right? Let's, let's take a poll in the room. Who in this room, right, when they get attacked or upset or somebody comes against you with some lies, who in here is like a fighter? Who's going to step into that and fight, Right? That's me, by the way. That's your pastor. I naturally, in my flesh, in my fallen humanity, will naturally want to go, hey, let's go. Like, let, let's get on, let's, let's get, clear everything out of the living room, and we're going to throw down. Forgive me. I forgive you. And then who in the room is a flight, or who runs from conflict, from right from the fight who's like oh lord i don't want any a part of that guess what neither are a part of god's will like neither talk about that in a minute i actually heard a dad share with me this morning someone who i respect and love tremendously he said and i won't tell you his name because it's a little bit personal he said in their house all the kids were like mur, 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 and calling each other names and bickering and fighting and then the parents kind of started little, little, little. everybody was kind of going at each other's throat reminds me of season two of yellowstone if you haven't seen it like it just is and and the youngest little dude in the family says hey this is the youngest one family meeting i'm calling a family meeting and everybody in the house stops what they're doing and they said all right and the dad honors the son and said all right we're having a family meeting what do you have to say son son goes we're done fighting we're done fighting today we're gonna love one another the youngest one in the house called the family meeting that's his kingdom that's his presence. And even sometimes it takes the youngest person in the room to say, we're done fighting. We're going to love one another, amen? 
Like no more fighting, no more running. We're going to gather together in his name. Here's the truth. Followers of Jesus, this is a reminder of what we started last week. Follower of Jesus can see the contrast of those two kingdoms. When we're walking in the word, walking with one another, when we're like seeking the Lord in prayer, when we're sensitive to what the Holy Spirit's doing in us, we can see these two kingdoms. They're so obvious. And in this series, we're actually contrasting one of the kingdoms is Babylon or the world, the fallen world, where actually God kicks out one of his own, Lucifer, a beautiful angel, to the earth. You guys know this, right? Where he roams freely. One of them is represented by our television show, Yellowstone. We're calling that Babylon. We're contrasting that against God's kingdom, which we're talking about today, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. These two kingdoms, the first is of the fallen world of Babylon, or Babylon, which we know from Ezekiel, from Isaiah, the prophets. The second is the kingdom of God. Here's the contrast, and I'm just going to read it. Jesus said these actual words, John 10, 10. This is what we're talking about. The thief comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy Babylon. Like if you turn on the show Yellowstone, and I'm not telling you to, it's what you're going to see. And they mean well. Like in our humanity, we mean well, don't we? Like we just, we want to fight for what's right. But if you let the enemy lead you, it's going to be kill, destructive for you and the other people. But if we'll submit that same scenario to God, he says, I will fight on your behalf. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Amen? The thief comes to only to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I came so that you may have life. That you may have life and have it abundantly. That's the contrast we're talking about. Titus 2, 11 through 15, we read last week. Let me share it again this morning as a reminder. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, talking about Jesus, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives today in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, waiting to be taken to heaven, the appearing of glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, waiting for him to return to take us to heaven with them. Amen. Who's ready for that? Who gave himself for us, for you, to redeem you from all lawlessness and to purify for himself to people for his own possession. That's you who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort, meaning encourage, and rebuke with all authority that means to correct let no one disregard you here's the deal we all love the exhorting part like we we all love the encouraging part right i'm going to encourage you in the scripture i'm going to love you like jesus did i believe that here's the part we don't like i'm going to rebuke you with the scripture meaning correct you who knows the scripture like iron sharpens iron right? I don't know about you, but when two swords hit one another, what happens? Sparks. And man, don't get in the way of those, right? Don't be in the path of a sword swinging. That is a rebuke by the word of God that's also called a sword. And a rebuke is for us, for his people, not to judge the world with. It's literally for his church. Rebuke one another. Like we need both. It takes a humble person to receive and accept both. Are you in a place in your life where you will accept both from a brother and sister that loves you, right? All of us need it. Men, you need other men in your life to encourage you and hold you accountable. Women, you need other godly ladies in your life to encourage you and hold you accountable. And man, that moment where someone corrects you and you want to say, that's not me. Just for a second go, wait, wait. This is a sister who loves me. 
right? This is a brother who loves me. I need this. All right, enough hay bale soapbox talk. Let's keep going. Matthew 16, 24 through 36. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me, meaning completely deny this flesh, this desire for vengeance, this desire of what the world has taught us, this fallen world that says you deserve to win this. You deserve to be right. You deserve, right, to get back at them. That's of the world. That's not of God. That's not of God. Come after me. Let him deny himself. Deny all that stuff, that emotion we have in this. Take up our crosses, his cross, and follow me. For whoever, and this is so hard for us to learn sometimes, for whoever would save his life will lose it, meaning humble myself completely, die to self. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Wow, that is the opposite of what this fallen world is teaching us, right? Whoever will lose themselves, deny, die to self, will actually find life. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, if he gains this Babylon and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? He's talking about our bodies, when we pass away, you guys know what happened to our bodies, right? They put us in a box. They lower us into the ground. And our bodies slowly turn back into what? Dirt. The same dirt that God pulled up with his hands and breathed life into us with his very own mouth, with his very own words in the beginning, and created men and women we go back to that. Our spirit goes to heaven to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. We can talk about that later. But when Christ returns the second time, he raises up. It says he raises up the dead in Christ. I believe that means he raises up our bodies in Christ. And maybe even those that died before Christ came to this earth, but he raises those bodies. We get new heavenly bodies, something I'm excited about. Whole other sermon. I found this quote this week that gets close to talking about what we're trying to talk about in this series, his kingdom, his presence, who we belong to. Randy Alcorn, he's a pastor, he's an author, he says it this way, you belong to God. Listen to this. You belong to God, not yourself. You belong to God, not yourself. He is the only one who has the right to do what he wants with your life. God doesn't just own the universe. He owns you and he owns me. And this isn't like a slave master ownership, even though the Bible describes us as that. Like Paul came and said, you're no longer slaves. I mean, we're slaves to Christ. It's a, it's a counterintuitive truth. You're no longer slaves, but Christ counts you as his what? As his friend. But he still, he created us. He owns us. He owns, let me say this for a moment. Some of you need to hear it. I do. He owns your thoughts. He owns your emotions. He owns your ambitions, men, who are trying to make a mark on this earth, something that's bigger than yourself, that will outlast yourself. He created that in you. He created it in you. Same thing for you, ladies. He owns all of it. He owns your emotion. He owns your good days. He owns your bad days. He owns your house. He owns the land that it's deeded to, right? He owns the hills and all of the, the cattle that you raise with it, right? Or some people that I know, the goats that you have. We've got three at our house now and two sheep. We had friends over last night. We got to enjoy it around a campfire even though it felt like it was 15 degrees. Who was outside last night? I mean, it was 30, 46 or something. It felt like it was 18, 15. It was chilly. He owns all of that. He owns all of it. I 
living for his kingdom in this world requires this. It requires us. This is, what we're, this is the main point for today. It requires us to seek his presence. It requires us to seek his presence. We're going to talk about how to do that interpersonally, leading ourselves first to his presence and then leading others to his presence. Let me say this first and foremost. I praise God for the men and women in this church that get this. I praise God for the men and women in our church that are submitted to his word, submitted to him, obedient in the spirit, knowing that God owns everything and has decided, God, I'm going to bring your presence to our church with the giftings that you gave to me and the passions that you gave to me. Guess what happened this weekend? We had a ladies get together, a tea meet up. Because one of our ladies, who's very creative and wants to share her creativity and actually bring people together in our church, they got together and had tea. The tables were amazingly like built and decorated. Good job, Alyssa. Darby, great job, Joseph, for encouraging your wife to do that. We also had a, a men's breakfast this Saturday morning, and, and most of you guys are like, man, that's my only day to sleep in because you, you drag me to church every Sunday, so at least let me have Saturday to sleep in. I hear you. But it was cool. David Eastridge, Sean Doolin, several other guys got up and just fixed breakfast so guys could just meet around the table, have coffee, and encourage one another. The same thing happening in our auto ministry. They're actually using God's gift, the things that he possessed, that he gave to us, using that gift to share the light and the love in this community to bring what? His presence. Well done. The same with our food pantry every Friday. Like these are all areas that I encourage you to join. And Zach just mentioned it. We actually have a brand new marriage like study for you starting here in the next week or two with Mike and Joanne Logan. We're actually gonna be building a space and making a cool coffee shop hangout group meeting space just for you guys. So sign up for that. Be ready for God to do something amazing to seek his presence for your marriage together. Praise God for you. We'll be announcing small groups next week. We finally have all of our small group details. Thank you for being patient. We're going to put them in the bulletin and let you guys sign up or at least get to know, get to meet some of these leaders next week. Praise God for you. Living for his kingdom in this world requires us to seek his presence. How are you seeking his presence? And if you need some help with that, like that's what today is about, but I want to talk to you about it. Several of our guys and, and men and women will talk to you about this. How do we seek his presence together? Ezra 8.21 says it this way. This is the, what a few and me, me and a couple of brothers last week practiced out in the woods. We decided to get quiet to just bring water with us, sit around by a campfire and just get in his word and pray for, gosh, a day and a half, all through the night. Ezra 8.21 says, Then I proclaimed a fast there where they weren't eating, they were just drinking water and just focusing on God at the river of Ahava that we might afflict ourselves. It's talking about the hunger pains that come when you, when you don't eat, when you're just focused on prayer and spending time with God before our God to seek of him a right way for us. And here's what's cool, a right way for us and a right way for our little ones, or let me talk to you guys who own your own companies, who are the head of your households, who have large departments, or are involved in leading our community. The, we need to know the right way for us, and we need to be able to lead others to the right path. That's what they're doing. They're seeking God to say, God, show me the right way, and for the little ones or the, or the people around me and for all of our substance. We're basically saying, I'm willing to go hungry, right? And say, Lord, man shall not live on bread alone, but what? But on every word of the mouth of God. Jesus modeled that for us, and we're about to read the story where that came from. 
to say, God, I need your presence. I need your presence. In this day and age, I need to know what's right. Am I alone in this? Right? What's right is not my emotion. You guys know that, right? Emotions often are so deceiving. Man, I mean, just practice this. Have a brother punch you in the nose. Just say, hey, square up and hit me right here. And then write down your emotions after you get hit in the nose. You're not going to write anything down. You're going to square up and hit them back. Don't, don't do that, by the way. I mean, we do have some dudes in here in jiu-jitsu. It's a lot safer. You can take each other to the ground. You don't have to break each other's noses. The point is, the point is, like sometimes you're like, bro, you just hit me in the nose. Are you serious right now? And then half of you are going to wait till later and, and just stab him or hit him with a baseball back over the back of the head. I know who you are. You don't fight, you don't fight right. You fight dirty. kidding living for his kingdom in this world requires us to seek his presence this scripture in Ezra is talking about sometimes we have to be afflicted to go without to seek his voice and his word and his prayer so that he can tell us which way is right we might want to hit the dew back in the nose scripture says give me your other cheek right when somebody comes into your house and steals your clothes and your guns, right? Scripture says, well, give them more clothes, right? He takes the coat, give them your shirt too. That's bizarre. It doesn't say anything about the guns, by the way. I just threw that in there. That's Arkansas edition. But seriously, like this is what... This is what Christ is teaching us and his words teaching us. This is the difference between Yellowstone, Babylon, and God's kingdom. Yellowstone and Babylon is great at confirming these things in us that are of the world. Yeah, punch them back, you know? And Jesus is saying, no, 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 give them your shirt too. Well, I love that dude. No matter what he does to you, the accusations, the lies, the like... Love them. And I promise you, I'm going to take care of them. I'm going to take care of them. Living in his kingdom, here's, here's the truth, and here's how crazy it is. Living in his kingdom is a man shall not live on bread alone kind of kingdom. Who's done this before? Who's done fasting in here, right? Fasting and praying and has you guys, have you guys ever survived a 40-day fast, by the way? Like, no food for 40 days? I'm just curious. I don't think many people have. Maybe Jesus. Most I've ever done is like, and I'm not bragging, I won't tell you, but it's nowhere near that. Nowhere. Here's where this comes from. And we'll talk about why. Matthew 4, 1 through 11, says this. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit, pay attention, led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, which is more like desert and some shrubbery, not the forest that we think of when we hear wilderness, to be tempted by the devil. The Spirit led Jesus to the wilderness to be tempted. Sounds a lot like Job, doesn't it? Sounds a lot like when God spoke to Abraham and said, sacrifice your own son. Like sometimes the Spirit's going to ask you to do some stuff that you're like, why in the world are you taking us here, right? But if you trust God, you'll keep going. Jesus was led to the Spirit into the wilderness, tempted by the devil after fasting 40 days and 40 nights. This is Jesus. He didn't eat. He was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stories, tell these stones to become bread. Basically, he said, pick up a rock and turn it to bread. You're the son of God. But Jesus said, he answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word of the mouth of God. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word of the mouth of God. Isn't that amazing? You remember where we came from? 
We came from dust. We came from dirt. But God, what? Spoke life into us through what? Through his word. Through his word. We have God's powerful word that can speak life. Did you know praying in Jesus' name can actually take the darkness from you, from your home, from your, like every part of your life in Jesus' name, right? Let no evil take hold of my family in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, protect us from the evil one, right? Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil in Jesus' name. If you've never done this, like, I'll tell you a little crazy story. When we were kids, we used to, like, play all these, like, we'd go find the oldest haunted-looking house in the neighborhood. Who's ever done that? Actually gone to a haunted house in the neighborhood, or so you think. We'd be in there, like, at 11 p.m., super dark, moon's not out. We would be so freaked out, we finally would run back to our home, and then we'd be what? We'd be praying in Jesus' name. <laughs> like, Jesus' name, protect it. Like, we put ourselves there. And good Lord, at least we had the sense to get out of there. And thank goodness we were able to pray in his name to protect us. There is power in the Jesus in Jesus' name. Let me continue. Then the devil took Christ to the holy city. This is in verse 5, Matthew 4, verse 5 took him into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. He does the same thing with you and me, by the way. We'll talk about it. If you were the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it is written, God, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands. They'll save you. They'll catch you so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. So you won't hurt yourself. He's saying, you're God, save yourself. Jesus replies, it is also written. Again, he's sharing what? He's sharing the word. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Both times Jesus does what? He answers the evil one with the word. Guys, if the God of the universe came to this earth and during the battle and during the temptation, if this is the one thing that Jesus models for us so well, he says, know my word. It is the way to life. He said, it is the only way through the darkness, only way through the evil one. In my name and God's word, we, that's how we fight this battle. This is how we take the light to the darkness, is by knowing his word. Again, the devil took him up to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms and of the world and of their glory. Now he's showing him everything that existed back in that day, as far as the eye can see. All this I'll give to you, Lucifer said, because Lucifer was freed to roam the earth. It's, he is on this earth even to this day in a spiritual sense, the spiritual realm. He is loosed on this fallen world. It's his Babylon. Remember, world versus God's kingdom. He reigns and rules freely to take as many people as he can until Christ come back the second time. So here is one of God's fallen angels acting like he's in charge of the world. He's meeting Christ in a moment of weakness after 40 days of not eating. All this I'll give to you, Lucifer said, if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus answered, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Sounds like what? Sounds like the first commandment, isn't it? Thou shalt be no other gods before me. No other gods before me. Again, here's what's cool. Jesus uses the word. He's actually reciting scripture from the Old Testament. People often ask me, hey, Larry, do we have to read the Old Testament? I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. 
And Christ said that over and over and over. He even said, I came back to fulfill all the Ten Commandments in the law. But we're not, we're not leaving them out. He's just saying, I want you to do those things and what I'm trying to teach you to love God and love others. He constantly quotes the Old Testament to us. And then, here's what's amazing. The devil, then the devil left Christ and angels came and ministered to him. How many times do we get to see in Scripture? If you will ask, if you will simply ask your Father God in Jesus' name, he will send angels and heavenly hosts to protect you in the spiritual world. You guys know this, right? We see a very physical world with our eyes. We sense in our spirit that there is a spiritual battle all around us. You have to know there is a spiritual war happening and God will send his angels to fight for you. It's the reason why he says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Your battle is not against what? Flesh and blood. Your battle is not against these other people you see. It's not. That is a distraction. That is a deception of the real enemy. Your battle is against forces and principalities, and he's talking about the darkness. It's so hard for us to wrap our mind around these things. But then the devil left him, and angels came and ministered to him. Why? Because he was fully God. But this is for us. He was fully man, and he was being tempted at one of his weakest moments, just like you and me. And God says, just ask me. In Jesus' name, send me an army to fight this for me. What's cool is Jesus testing reveals the battle between two kingdoms. Jesus' testing for 40 days and 40 nights actually reveals this spiritual battle between evil and and God, between evil and good, between light and darkness, Jesus' temptation says, guys, in this fallen world, he says what, you will have trouble, right? And he can carry you through it. And here's just practical, and God's word will carry you through it. For me personally, Isaiah 26.3 is, is my go-to. He will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. This is mine. It won't be up on the screen. I'm just, I'm literally sharing with you. Isaiah 26, 3. He will keep you. He will keep me in perfect peace whose, when my mind is stayed on him, when I'm focused on him and his presence and his word, he will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because we what? Because I trust in him. He will keep you in perfect peace when your mind is stayed on him and his word because you trust him. Think about that for a moment. Do you trust him with your kids? Do you trust him with your career? Do you trust him at your work? And sometimes at work you feel like, oh my gosh, my boss is looking for one more reason to get rid of me. Who's ever been there, right? This person doesn't like me. Talk about fallen world stuff. You can trust him with loss. Those of you that are maybe grieving right now, whether it's a loss of a marriage or a loss of a loved one or a loss of something, he, you can trust him with those things. You will keep those in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on you because you can trust him. Here's the truth, and we'll get to the finish line. In the end, only one kingdom will stand. God's eternal kingdom. In the end, only one kingdom will stand. Only one. The other kingdom, the scripture calls it hell. It calls it a place that is absence of God's presence. A place we don't want to be. We want to be in God's presence. In the end, only one kingdom will stand. Psalm 119 says it this way. 
turn down the lights for me if you don't mind. I want to read this. I want everybody to hear. Psalm 119 says, I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light unto my path. His word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know what's crazy about this? His word, this scripture, your word is a lamp. It literally is a lamp. Back then, all they had were lamps to light the way of the path. And these lamps only illuminated exactly what they needed to see. Your word is a lamp and to my feet. This lamp will only shine for your next step on that path. This lamp only has enough light, right? Imagine it being pitch black, only has enough light to show you one next step. And this is how God reveals his will in your life, his path. Just trust me with one next step, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Just like Jesus gave us. Just like when the devil was tempting him. Jesus quoted scripture. Right now, I just want to, I just want to repeat this for you. It's about meditation on God's word. Father, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Say this with me if you don't mind. Just repeat after me. I'll make it really simple. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Stand with me as we conclude. going to pray in just a moment and after that we'll have one of our ministry leaders come up and take us through communion I just want to pray and for those of us that have said Father I'm yours like I just want to pray and say Commit all of yourself to him. Commit this week to just opening this book up like Christ did when he's walking through the darkness, when he's battling temptation to say, Father, I'm going to, I'm going to read your word aloud. I'm going to pray in Jesus' name. This is the, I'm just going to tell you, this is the only way that you are going to battle successfully against this dark world. This is the only way. And I'm excited because I've seen it happen in my own life and I know that you will see its victory. For those of you that have not gotten to the point where you said, I'm done with myself, like 
I need Christ to be Lord of my life. I want to be someone who's in the word. Like, let me just say, I'm going to pray in just a moment. Now's your day. Like, now's the time to say, I'm done with this world. I'm done with myself. I'm finally dying to self. God, forgive me. Christ, you're my Lord. I'm all in. I'm following you. Pray with me. Dear God, we love you. I'm so thankful for your presence. I'm so thankful for who you are. Father, I thank you that the word just shows us so clearly that even Christ in 40 days of temptation and of pain and of hunger, he modeled this for us. He showed us what it meant to have your word as a light to our path, as a lamp to our feet. Father, thank you for calling us to you. Thank you for turning up the voice of your Holy Spirit for never letting us go. Father, forgive us and thank you that Christ is the Lord of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.